I'm Ira Coleman, and we're here at BTC Blockchain Training Conference, and we have Justin Ehrenhofer. Thank you very much for joining us today and giving us some insight on your experience uh, here at this conference. How did you get involved in this technology, and what are you up to today? Yeah, thanks again, Ira, for having me on. So I got interested in, in Bitcoin for the first time watching it on the Colbert Report, actually. There was an interview that Stephen Colbert had with... Uh, an interview that explained why Bitcoin had any value at all, because it was one of the first times the price had reached mainstream news about its significant recent appreciation and depreciation. So I was like, I want to learn more about this. So that was when I was a junior in high school. I spent a little bit of time learning about it. But as I learned about it, I really found that it wasn't what I would consider private. It was something I noticed pretty early because I had previously spent some time with Tor and I2P. I, I knew about those before I learned about Bitcoin. And so I looked at the time for what type of privacy technologies were available. And as I was an undergrad at the University of Minnesota, I realized there wasn't a student group on campus. So I joined a few friends to start one there. And so we had one for the four years I was an undergrad there. And during that time, I focused a lot of my attention on the solutions that help make cryptocurrencies, the information that's actually stored on the blockchain or leaked to the network, more private. And you know, that's, that's a strong focus of mine. Great, great. So you're watching a, you're watching a show. You hear yeah. the word uh, Bitcoin, and it just pings interest to you. Mm -hmm. um, what? At, you know, so, so the BTC is about you know education, you know informing people. How did you go out there and find information to educate yourself at that time? This is a while ago, but yeah, so there certainly was a less information at the time. You had the beginnings of some of the introductory videos, so it was going through the process of learning what mining was and what blockchain transactions look like. And I did not just sit down for a weekend and go through all the materials that were available. It was initially a pretty long process, a very leisurely process where once a week I'd maybe read an article until I felt reasonably comfortable with the basics. I had some initial interest in mining. I think a lot of people thought mining was really cool back in the day, and I had always wanted to make a mining rig very early on. I made one my sophomore year, but it didn't turn out too well because I went to go study abroad and it wasn't running the entire time. So it didn't work out so well. But initially, it was seeking out a lot of the basic resources about learning how information is stored on the on Bitcoin's blockchain. It was all my, my research at the time was all Bitcoin focused. And then, as I mentioned, I, re, I was really interested in learning the privacy features or the implications about how the data was stored and how people were trying to obfuscate their transactions using technologies like CoinJoin, using mixers, and you know, new technologies like, or new implemented technologies like ring signatures and zero knowledge uh, ZK Starks, which, uh, ZK Snarks, sorry, that were recently developed um, around that time period. And you know, here we are today at you know BTC two, uh, 2019, and you know the, the continuing focus of, of education, and right now being more inclusive, bringing you know various levels of, of knowledge together in, in, in one space. Um, <clears throat> what do you look forward to in your personal experience of being here, and what are you looking to receive? Um, out of this experience? I really believe that education is extremely important. It was the main motivating um, factor for me to start the student group on campus because if students were in a similar position where they were excited like I was about cryptocurrencies, there wasn't a great physical community in Minneapolis where I was for you to go learn about it. So I felt like it was really important for us to have a local meetup where you could ask these questions. You could start off without getting pushed in the direction of a scammer or some other project where you might not be getting the best sort of information from. So it was really, really important to have a group where you can focus on these type of questions and answer them in a really, really productive way. And so here at BTC 2019, I, I think it's really, really important that we have speakers that are speaking on a variety of topics, whether it's on privacy like I am or several other speakers are, are talking about, or about the implications of Facebook's Libra that are coming out, or more development-focused things like dApps on uh, Bitcoin Cash or, or other applications. So I think it's really important, and I'm glad that we have these type of conferences so that people can learn a lot of information and it's not just 
information that people will learn at the conference. If they're not here, they'll be able to watch videos later. And it'll serve as an additional repository of information people can use for many years. So you said that you're going to be speaking here at the conference on security. Can you uh, talk about a little bit more insight about what that looks like for us? Sure. So I'm speaking on Friday at noon, and I'm speaking about the importance of privacy in these decentralized systems. Most people aren't going to understand the implications of what is being recorded and how. People don't really understand it for their credit cards, let alone this other system that they, they already don't understand how Bitcoin works. So it's important that when we encourage people to use these systems and as we have advocates that are familiar with it, that we strongly prioritize these privacy features for individuals so that they can use it and have strong privacy protections without thinking about without thinking about it. They shouldn't have to worry about all the information they're leaking. They shouldn't have to go through an incredibly long process or be an expert and try to figure this stuff out because frankly, most of the experts screw up somewhere when they're trying to protect themselves. So it's critically important that as an ecosystem, we treat this, uh, the, the privacy issue as something that is, is really deserving of our attention. And we also need to make it simple for users to use even if they have no idea what these protections are or, or any of the nuances of them. Um, they don't necessarily need to know, but in the current ecosystem, they're probably going to use a system that doesn't have many protections. Sure, sure. So you know, beginning to set a standard, beginning to set a, a, a benchmark um, that everyone can step into and give peace of mind you know, you know, additionally moving forward. Yeah, exactly. We're designing a system that's supposed to be accessible. It's supposed to allow people to you know, be more autonomous with their money. That's difficult if you have a non-fungible asset, where if, if I'm sending you one Bitcoin, for example, and you're like, well, of course, I'll take a free Bitcoin, right? There are a lot of other checks that you should have in place. And so it really gets in the way of commerce, where, in fact, you're almost re-adding these payment processors back into the system because you need someone to verify that the funds that I'm giving you aren't from North Korea or aren't associated with the ransomware attack that I, you know, perhaps created and I'm trying to give you money as a result. So it's a really, really messy problem. And it's something that as the OTC firm that I work with, we really struggle with because we need to make sure that we're compliant and accepting funds and that the counterparties we're sending funds to, you know, will accept the funds we're trying to give them. Um, because it could be funds we accept that are not nefarious, but our counterparties might not want. Sure. So it's, sure. it's very messy and complicated. So, you know, the industry is obviously facing these barriers um, and these challenges right now today. What kind of resources and support do you believe is, is most necessary to continue to move that needle uh, moving forward? So I think a lot of it is just better understanding and compliance. Uh, luckily, from the, like the U.S. government and the, on the federal and state levels, they've started issuing better better guidelines on how specific regulations will be applied for cryptocurrencies. And no matter how those regulations go in, in you know, favor of certain projects or unfavorably, the clarification is really nice. And so uh, like I work in Illinois, for instance, and they have a guideline of how they would like to address some of their state money transmitter licenses. And just having that information out really makes things easier for us as a firm. So I would say, regulatory clarity, no matter where it comes from, is really the most important thing because everyone wants to know where that line is. And so I think over the past several years we've gotten there and I think the SEC has made significant moves to make it more clear, but we still haven't tested a lot of the gray areas and I expect that to come out, sh shake out. It might take five years to do, but we're moving in that direction and there's more clarity now than there was even three years ago. So I would say regulatory over, uh, Clarity is one strong perspective. Also, I think that businesses still sort of treat it as this sort of mythical being. They treat cryptocurrencies as this, this weird project. And although projects like Facebook's Libra are helping to legitimize it and get larger businesses on board, most still feel uncomfortable with it. So I think they need more time to feel comfortable with it. The best thing that I think actually could happen to the ecosystem are to have strong futures markets. So that way you have people who work in finance betting on the future price of Bitcoin, for instance, and then all of a sudden people aren't assuming the price in one year will be between zero and $200 million per coin. They're going to be like, okay, well, there's a billion dollars worth saying it'll be worth $10,000. Sure. So just having that type 
or those type of strong financial instruments, I think will really reassure businesses and other institutional investors. And there recently have been more projects that have permitted those type of investments. And ultimately, those are good for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, in my opinion. What are some, some, some case studies um, that you would like to see more of uh, come to fruition, either by you know, big names, big companies, enterprise level, to obviously um, continue to move that adoption a little bit quicker? So I would like to see some clarification on the implications of accepting transparent cryptocurrencies. So by that I mean, you know, if, if you are working in a company, it doesn't even need to be an exchange. It could be you're just some other independent company and you're considering accepting cryptocurrencies for some project that you would like to work on. Well, you might be exposed to risk if you, again, accept funds that could be tainted and you might not be able to actually use those. They might be worth less value than they, you know, other comparable coins. So just having some clarification there, if we're not able to get strong privacy protections in the base layer, is, is something that I would, I would love to see. I think that as more and more institutions use services to audit the source of funds before accepting them, Bitcoin will become much less fungible over the next few years. And I think that will have real implications on how people do business. I think it's a significant barrier that has only started to evolve. Great. Well, Justin, thank you very much for spending time with us uh, today and this week. I'm wishing nothing, I'm wishing nothing but the best. Thank you, Ira. Thank I appreciate you. it.